All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Balance and Falls Special Interest Group for APTA Geriatrics 2024 National Falls Prevention Awareness Week kickoff call. Ooh, what a mouthful. Uh, my name is Dr. Heidi Moyer, and I am the current chair of the APTA Geriatrics Balance and Fall SIG. And along with many, many other people that helped make this evening happen, uh, we are very excited to be able to present this content to you. Um, so without further ado, and, and before we get too much into the call, I do just want to hand the mic over to Miles Quibben, who is here representing APTA Geriatrics Executive Board. So um, Miles, if you wouldn't mind kind of giving us uh, an introduction and sure. uh, just a, a quick warm welcome. Yeah, sure. I didn't know I was going to go first. That was quick. <laughs> so what better way to start off by saying first, congratulations to the Balance and Fall SIG for putting this together. I truly, truly, on behalf of the board of directors, thank you so much to the leadership of the Balance and Fall SIG. Heidi, I know you and your team really worked hard on this, but also an acknowledgement of the other SIG chairs that are here today and representing the Cognitive and Mental Health SIG, our newly formed APTA Geriatric Skilled Nursing uh, Group, and also the Cognitive and Mental Health SIG. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but those are the ones that are represented, you're right? I wanted to say this is a big um, activity it requires a lot of work to put all these great people together um, at a certain time and get it all at the same time. So it requires a lot of coordination, a coordinated effort, and really passion to get it here. So on behalf of the board, thank you and congratulations for putting this together and for getting giving us a, a, a real good example of how the SIGs can work together for the betterment of our older adults. So Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing what you have tonight. It looks like a really interesting uh, presentation. And with that, I appreciate you. The board appreciates you. And on behalf of Kathy, our president, who is out sick tonight, welcome everybody. And here we go with the National Fall Prevention Awareness Week. Awesome. Heidi, Thank all you. yours. Thank you so much, Miles. We really appreciate having you guys here. Um, I just want to take a moment of gratitude to, again, acknowledge all of the people that helped put this together um, on the Balance and Fall SIG side. And you're going to get a chance to hear from the representatives from the other special interest groups as well. Um, even though it's usually my face that you see on things, it is not my work <laughs> normally. Um, we're a really incredibly dedicated team. Uh, the group that we have has a ton of creative energy, but also a lot of the energy to make things happen. So I just want to give a moment of gratitude to all of the behind the scenes people that you don't normally see. So the theme for this year's call are the five M's of geriatric care. Um, and this is a model that is not brand new, new, um, but it's recent enough that it's still not currently fully integrated into clinical practice. And we felt that this was an amazing opportunity as the balance and fall SIG to be able to integrate this model and to demonstrate how easy it is to be able to address all five of these things consistently to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar, the five M's of geriatric care are mind, mobility, medications, multi-complexity, and what yeah. matters most. So we're going to be hearing on our from our speakers on each of these topics. Uh, basically, how tonight is going to go is we will be giving kind of short 10-minute TED Talks, high-impact information that you'll be able to apply to your clinical setting or to in your teaching and academia as well immediately the next day. We want to make sure that you guys get as much information as possible. All right, and then uh, we will be introducing our speakers as we go along, but these are the folks that we do have represented and we're very, very excited to have them. So I'm actually going to be handing over the rest of the speaking duties for the evening to Beth Quinn, who is our community outreach liaison for the Balance and Fall SIG. And she from here forth will be taking over the responsibility of introducing our speakers and serving as your MC for the evening. So we can get a round of applause for Beth. I'll have her introduce herself and then we will get started with our first speaker. Thank you, Heidi. Um, again, my name is Beth Quinn. I'm the Director of Clinical Education at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm very excited to be um, starting to contribute to this group. Um, so newly minted, Heidi's still telling me what to do and it's great. So 
With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. She serves as the Vice Chair of the APTA Geriatrics Health Promotion and Wellness SIG, and we'll talk about our first topic of the evening, medication and falls. Dr. Amy Walters is a full-time faculty member in Austin, Texas, on campus of the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences, where she teaches geriatric PT and pharmacology. Dr. Walters joined as core faculty in 2016, and she completed her BA in psychology from the University of Texas at Austin, her master of physical therapy from the University of Texas medical branch, and her DBT from the College of St. Scholastica. She also has a PhD in health psychology. Dr. Walters' clinical practice has been focused on sports physical therapy and geriatric physical therapy in outpatient and home health settings. In addition, she taught um, PT continuing ed courses nationwide on integrating yoga and Pilates into PT practice. She has board certifications in sports PT as well as geriatric PT um, overachiever. In addition, she became a certified expert for aging adults in 2019. She currently serves as one of the state advocates for Texas for the APTA geriatrics, as well as the vice chair of, for the health promotions and wellness SIG. Dr. Walters, take it away. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, I feel like uh, pharmacology, I'm glad you started with this because it's always the hardest sell with my students to get them into it, but I feel like clinicians have more of an appreciation you know, once you get out, you're like, wow, this is really, this is really important. <laughs> so I'm excited to talk a little bit about medications. Um, so to start, I just wanted to address why it's such a problem that we see so many adverse drug reactions in older adults. Um, the one we'll specifically talk about today being falls, um, but just some background to kind of why they tend to have more problems with medications. Um, and some of that's just the presence of multiple disease states, multiple comorbidities in this population. Um, that means multiple medications, right? Polypharmacy. And then it's also going to be a lot of problems processing medications a lot of times because these disease states might impact the liver, might impact the kidneys. And that's how you're really going to eliminate, metabolize these medications. So more likely to develop a toxicity. Um, there's not great drug testing with this population. So a lot of times, you know, when they, you're not doing studies on individuals with multiple disease states and all this polypharmacy. So a lot of times, you know, we're, we're, we're really not sure how they're gonna react to some of these medications. Um, Non-adherence can be a big issue with older adults and we'll address this later because um, I think it's really important education piece but also I think it's really important to realize that a lot of times this is an unintentional non-adherence, right? It's not that they're just not following the instructions, but a lot of times it's more of a health literacy issue, right? Where we really need to make sure that they can read the labels, they can open the bottles, um, they understand these complex drug regimens. Um, and so big role for PT to really educate and, and help patients here. Um, and then the issue of inappropriate medications for this population. So we're gonna talk about some lists where you can help kind of identify what medications might be inappropriate. Next. All right, so the main side effects are gonna be any drugs that have primary side effects that are sedating, syncope, dizziness, drowsiness, changes in blood pressure, and impaired balance. Those are obviously gonna be the, the big side effects, they're gonna increase risk of falls. And what we're gonna find is a lot of times it's medications that impact the nervous system and medications that impact the cardiovascular system. And I'm gonna talk more about these in a second. So next. So these are some of the main drug classes that we really have to kind of be on the lookout for. So any of your medications for anxiety, like a lot of your benzodiazepines, those can be really problematic with older adults. Um, any of these medications that are trying to calm, sedate, help with sleep, um, it's very understandable that that's going to be problematic and increase fall risk. Um, a lot of hangover effects with those medications where they're still in their system the next day, um, and then that drowsiness can really impact their fall risk. Um, antidepressants, 
And then anti-dementia medications are also a, a common fall risk increasing drug class. Um, that's gonna be your antipsychotics. For cardiovascular medications, a lot of the ones that are gonna impact blood pressure, understandably are gonna increase fall risk because if we're trying to decrease blood pressure, a lot of times we overshoot the mark or we end up getting orthostatic hypotension. Um, so those beta blockers, ACE inhibitors are two drug classes that can be really problematic. Um, and those can be used for, again, heart failure, blood pressure, um, but you're also seeing those used sometimes for anxiety now, the beta blockers specifically, um, and then maybe some other cardiovascular conditions like angina, things like that. Um, so this one study found that the main meds that increase fall risk, um, and they listed them here, and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and antipsychotics. So again, these tend to be really problematic drug classes for a lot of older adults. Um, opioids, I feel like we're pretty familiar with this. Um, it's kind of a constant battle, I think, as PTs to minimize use of opioids, um, but dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, very common. And then anticholinergics. And these are gonna be used for COPD. Um, they are sometimes used for Parkinson's disease, but you can have other medications that while they're not an anticholinergic, they can have anticholinergic effects. And what they do is they dry the individual out. So the side effect is the dry mouth, dry eyes. Um, but the main one we're concerned about with fall risk is also confusion. So that's a big side effect of anticholinergics. Okay, next. Um, so Beer's Criteria is a great resource for listing potentially inappropriate medications. Um, and I just picked a couple snippets from it. Um, it's a great document to look through. Um, but for example, they list if someone has a history of falls or fractures, you should ideally, right, because it's always feasible, avoid anti-epileptics, antipsychotics, benzos, again, those are for anxiety, um, non-benzos, these are some of your sleep meds, antidepressants, um, these are some antidepressant classes, and then opioids. So you're seeing kind of the same medications, right? Um, avoiding anti-epileptics except for individuals with seizures and then opioids except for acute severe pain. And I think that's something PTs have really been pushing for a while. Um, another aspect to the criteria that I think is where we can really play a role is reducing the number of CNS medications. And I think we see this a lot with our older adults where they have anxiety, they have depression and they have problems sleeping and then they get put on medications for each of those conditions. And what can happen is you can get an additive effect, right? So not only do all of those individually have side effects that increase fall risk, but now you're in three different medications. So that's a great area where we can potentially, you know, have discussions about, you know, can your antidepressant help with anxiety and them having conversations with their doctor about really trying to kind of minimize some of those, maybe work on sleep hygiene, you know, is melatonin an option? I'm kind of looking at some other options. Next. And then the role of PT. So I think a lot of therapists are intimidated by pharmacology, especially depending on when you graduated. Um, and so I do think you have to kind of consider your knowledge, your comfort level, um, I think those in home health were used to a little bit more medication reconciliation and having to, to really work with the doctors a little bit more closely. But I think there's some simple things that we can all do to help. Um, and the first one is just asking if there's any changes in their medication or dosages. Um, and the reason this is so important is the side effects tend to be most severe when someone first starts the medication. So if someone's coming in with these um, you know, balance deficits or dizziness, um, these recent falls, and you can tie that to a drug that they just started, that's gonna kind of really help you with your differential diagnosis too, right? And you might see that change as their body kind of adapts to the drug. Um, so the first thing is just really asking about the medications, right? Um, identifying if the medication is causing the side effects, it's really important. And then I think our biggest role is communication. Like and I'm telling you how I. All right, and then I'll we'll go on to the next one. And I'll talk a little bit more about these. And I think this kind of summarizes our role nicely. Um, this was in the Jerry notes in April, 
Um, and it does a really great list of kind of um, really simplifying what, what, what are some of the things we can do. And the first is again, just making sure that they're taking them correctly. Are they, are they able to, you know, are, is the, is the regimen too complex, right? Are they needing um, help with that? Do we need to figure out how to simplify that? Um, do they know why they're taking these medications? Do they know what potential side effects are? Um, so really that health literacy component is important. Looking for potentially inappropriate medications. So there's great resources like beers, um, but I think the greatest resource out there is your pharmacist. And I think they're grossly underutilized. So really, really, really um, having them look for drug interactions and look at inappropriate medications is often a better route than going to the doctor. Um, again, indication for the medication has the problem resolved. You know, I think we see this a lot where someone's given something in a hospital, maybe that problem's resolved, but they're still on it. And that doctor doesn't want to take them off the medication, um, but they don't need it anymore. So really identifying that, um, can they be de-prescribed de de or simplified? You know, again, you think about older adults on 20 different medications that some you take with food, some you take without food, you might have to take them three or four times a day, um, can get really complex. So, you know, how can we, how can we help them? Are there extended release? You know, are there pill boxes? Do we need to get them alarms? So I think things like that might really improve adherence. Um, and then identifying symptoms related to medications. So again, we need that basic knowledge of what are common side effects of some of these medications. And then if we're asking about medication changes, hopefully we can kind of make those connections and then, and then open it up for a discussion with the doctor. Thank you. Did I make it under 10? <laughs> You did great. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and I believe Heidi put this in the chat, but if anyone has questions for our speakers, feel free to put them in the chat box and we can address those questions um, in a timely manner. So thank you so much, Amy. Great information. Next, we have the chair of the APTA Geriatrics Cognitive and Mental Health SIG speaking on our second topic of the evening, Mind and Falls. Alex Alexander is a board certified clinical specialist in geriatric physical therapy and is chair of the APTA Geriatrics Cognitive and Mental Health SIG. Alex graduated with her doctor of physical therapy from Carroll University in Waukesha, Wisconsin in 2017. Alex works in the home health setting right outside of Nashville, Tennessee and has been doing home health for seven years now. She's a big proponent for older adults and optimal and healthy aging. She's passionate about hospice and works as a hospice PT at her agency. Alex, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you guys. And thank you, Amy, for the great talk on uh, medications. So you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so first what we'll start with is just talking a little bit about statistics on cognition and falls and those that have dementia. So um, cognitive and mental health have pretty big impairments that can cause great bearing on balance performance and fall risk in the older adult population. So in the United States, dementia affects between 2.4 and 5.5 million people every year. And that's continually growing as the baby boomers start to emerge a little bit more each year. And its prevalence also increases as people age as well. So individuals that are diagnosed with dementia um, or cognitive impairment have a two to eight fold greater risk of falls compared to those who have normal cognition. So it's usually shown that those who have or test positive for a mild cognitive impairment usually have a 32% likelihood of developing dementia within the next five years. So these are going to be your folks that you're no noticing a little bit of forgetfulness, but they're not really scoring super high on some of your dementia screenings or on um, some of your actual dementia testing. And then those with cognitive impairments usually fall a little bit more often. And then those that do have dementia sustain more serious falls and fall injuries. Um, and they usually have an increased risk of mortality with those as well. And they are less likely to make a good functional recovery just because of their mentation and their ability to understand directions and follow cueing that we provide during our therapy. Um, also, older adults with cognitive impairments do have less fear of falling, which make their counterparts without cognitive issues um, have a little bit more um, injurious falls. 
And then also with all of this being said, early detection is going to be extremely important for us in the use of dual task training to allow for detection of cognitive impairment so we can try to reduce some of these falls. You can go on to the next slide, please. So I found this really cool, I guess you can call graphic that kind of talks about falls and kind of shows all the different factors that are included within falls. So you guys can kind of see all around falls, what contributes to falls, but what we will con uh, concentrate on is the cognitive factors. So when you're looking down at the cognitive factors, you have attention, sensory integration, and motor planning that are kind of highlighted there. And those are all included within executive functioning. So as we age, we do have a loss in executive functioning, attention, information processing, and reaction time that are in, uh, associated with increased risk of falls. So as far as executive functioning is concerned, it is the domain that is most commonly associated with gait dysfunction. Um, and the need for attention, sensory integration, and motor planning all decline with age, which is why we do see an increased risk of falls as we do age. So when you talk about attention specifically, divided attention has most closely been related to balance, gait, and fall risk. So <clears throat> attention or impairments in attention, I'm sorry, um, do prevent fallers from devoting resources to balance and gait, and then reduces the patient's ability to adapt to changes in their environment that do lead to the increased falls. Then when you go to look at sensory integration, we look at processing speed, which is a part of complex attention. And as we age, the processing time slows down for these folks. And then also the sensory input declines. So people are most likely to exhibit cautious gait, which then is a likely outcome when the processing speed and sensory input declines. So individuals with dementia may have more impaired interhemispheric transfer of information that leads to their impaired ability to integrate their sensory information around them. So overall, as we age, our motor planning declines and becomes less efficient, which then does lead to a problem with motor planning and programming. And then we can have gait dysfunction, which then will lead to falls. So it's kind of very complex, but basically attention, sensory integration, and motor planning all decline as we age, which is why we do see more falls in the older population. If you can go ahead and next slide, please. So when we look at um, effects of exercise in those with dementia, it's very important. So even though somebody with dementia may not be able to comprehend what we're doing or you know comprehend every single direction that we need them to follow, still getting some sort of exercise is gonna be important with these folks. So interventions that combine strength, balance, flexibility, and endurance, such as walking, have improved cognition, have decreased agitation, improved mood and mobility, and then also functional mobility in those with um, dementia. And the use of physical activity that's recommended for these folks is about 30 minutes twice a week. And that was the minimum threshold that did pro uh, produce significant benefits in this population. And it kind of just gives individuals positive experience and meaning to their day and breaks it up so they're not so lonely, they're not so bored, and they kind of feel like they have some sort of a routine or something to look forward to. And in those with dementia, it's shown that exercise can positively affect health and well-being just due to the reduction of cardiovascular disease, improvement in cerebral perfusion and blood flow to the brain, and then also increased production of neurotropic factors. So exercise that aimed at muscles um, induces neural plasticity as well, which may slow down or reverse the evolution of Alzheimer's disease. And then also the hippocampus is sensitive to exercise as well and can generate new neurons throughout one's lifespan due to it being one of the major sites of neuroplasticity. So just getting any type of movement, no matter what setting you're in, is going to be beneficial for these folks. And yes, we can't totally get rid of somebody's dementia or Alzheimer's, but we can at least just try to help with some of the side effects that come along with that as well. You can go on to the next slide, please. So I have included some um, evidence-based interventions here that are good for folks just overall for balance, but then also with those that respond well with dementia. So the Otago program is shown to reduce falls by about 35 to 40% in frail older adults if it's completed correctly. So the Otago program is something that um, 
you can get a certification for, but the Otago exercises can be taught as a home exercise program and then be delivered to non-physical therapists such as caregivers, um, either in the home or at a facility. And they have shown to be effective in improving physical performance measures and decreasing fall risk over a six month period. So it is something that needs to be done pretty regularly in order to see those beneficial effects. But usually it's completed about three times a week and um, there's also a stipulation of walking three times a week as well. And this was done over a 52 week period. The study was performed and usually they like the Otago program to be performed over a year's time. But it does include strength and balance exercises. Also, Tai Chi has been shown to improve balance in older adults and is also associated with reduction, a reduction in future fall frequency. So when we look at these interventions to improve executive functioning, we want to use interventions such as dual task, such as the Stroop test and the go-no-go -no -go test to reduce risk of falls, as we see that executive functioning is what is primarily impaired and leads to fall risk in those with dementia. And then also it has been shown as well that choreographed dance sessions have been shown to improve verbal recognition memory, improve visual delayed recall, and then as well as bait and get, gate performance. So it's not something where you have to choreograph this a big long dance, but I've noticed even in some of my sessions when I was working in a sniff where you just put on some music and just slow danced with somebody or just kind of let them be free in dance they actually showed pretty good improvements with the balance and strength just by doing this. And it also helped uh, memory, long-term memory as well, to bring back some of those memory so that may be associated with some songs that they're familiar with in their past. Um, so there are tons of specific interventions that be, can be completed to improve balance and minimize falls, especially ones with dual task training and executive function training. So um, under the Cognitive and Mental Health SIG page, we do have a um, Cognitive and Mental Health Toolkit that kind of goes through uh, different tests, but then also interventions that you can do depending on what domain you would like to work on with someone. And that is free to everybody. So it's awesome for you guys to download and easy for you guys to use in your clinic. You can go on to the next slide, please. So quickly, uh, strategies that we can use for patients and caregivers to remain active is just activities that promote gentle stretching, strength training, balance, and endurance, and just making sure our exercises focus on ease, availability, and pleasantness to the individual, creating reasonable exercise goals for the patient, providing clear instructions on how to monitor progress to caregivers, problem solving obstacles that arise uh, for the person and then follow a scheduled exercise activities so the patient has a routine. So you can go to the next slide, please. So lastly, to continue on, just making sure we're designing exercises in an easy to remember order for the individual. The use of handouts with magnets to put on the fridge to provide a visual cue to complete exercises and aid with carryover for caregivers. And then also use tracking forms to monitor progress and then the use of games and completion or um, competition as well as social interaction and challenges to improve um, the balance and ease of home exercise program for the individual. And I think time-wise we are out. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Next, we have two representatives from the APTA Geriatrics Mobility Screening Task Force speaking on our third topic of the evening, mobility and falls. Emma Belargen is a physical therapist and biomedical engineer, currently a postdoctoral scholar in the Division of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Emma's research focuses on integrating routine mobility assessment into healthcare for older adults. She also works on projects evaluating walking quality in older adults in home, lab, and clinical settings, as well as the influence of comorbid conditions such as urinary incontinence and glaucoma on gait. Next, or joining Emma will be Sterling Eckert. Um, he's a physical therapist practicing at an outpatient physical therapy and balance center in San Angelo, Texas. He graduated with his DPT from Angelo State University in 2020. In 2022, he joined the Doctor of Science program at Texas Tech University Health Science Center. 
His current clinical practice sees various geriatric, orthopedic, vestibular, and military populations. He has further clinical experience in skilled nursing, home health, and inpatient rehab settings. He's currently a member of the APTA Geriatric Task Forces for the Annual Mobility Screen in the National Senior Games Association. He also serves as the APTA Key Contact for the 11th U.S. Congressional District. I will hand it over to you too. All right. Thank you, Beth, for that great introduction. And thank you to Amy and Alex for the two presentations preceding. That was some really amazing information and uh, I'm enjoying this so far. So we're going to talk about mobility. And anytime you talk about a topic as broad as mobility, I think it's a good idea to start with definitions. What are we talking about? And fortunately, we have great organizations like the APTA that gives us definitions that we can build from and make sure we're on the same uh, playing field when we're talking about things. And the APTA defines mobility as seen on the screen. I'm, I'm trusting that you all know how to read, so I won't read it to you. But basically, if we boil this down, it's saying that how well does an individual move their muscles and their joints, and can they do that efficiently and effectively as they want to? And they break it down even further into describing functional mobility and then joint mobility. So functional mobility is what I think a lot of us PTs get excited about. It's those daily activities that we want our patients doing, going out and gardening, sit to stands, the fun activities that they do with their friends and family that we love to see those results and getting back to doing that activity. But underneath that, and what I like to call is like the prerequisites to functional mobility is joint mobility. And when we're talking about fall prevention or a fall occurring and reducing mobility, it creates this cycle of impairment in terms of mobility. So mobility being decreased, either functional or through joint mobility, leads to an increased risk of falls. And then the more falls you have, you have a more likelihood to decrease your mobility level. And it begins this vicious cycle to where we go around and around and around in a circle, perpetuating increased fall risk. And one of the big takeaways I want to get at with this slide is I want us to not fall into this trap as clinicians, which I loved. I always fall into this trap of strictly focusing on the functional aspect. I want to give my patient that thing that they're asking me for, that functional activity. And we're going to practice that, practice that, practice that. And forgetting about some of those underlying prerequisites that these patients need to perform said activity. So if it's a sit to stand or if it's gardening, whatever it may be, are we checking those detailed things that sometimes get lost, like ankle dorsiflexion, like great toe extension, um, you know, hip extension, things that are so important at the joint level and the muscular level that sometimes we let go by the wayside, especially in geriatric care, because we have this almost ageist bias and we're focused on getting that function back. I think it's a good thing, but if we slow ourselves down and look at some of those more detailed aspects of joint mobility, we're going to get a lot of bang for our buck and get our patients back to where we want them to be. And Emma is going to talk about some of the difficulties with mobility disability. Well, thank you, Sterling, not only for that great background, but also that great sort of pun there with falling into the trap. Um, I appreciate it. I hope everyone else did too. Um, so yes, I wanted to talk a little bit before we go further into how we're assessing and treating mobility. We also wanna give some information about the prevalence and significance of the problem. So this is not new news to any of you, but maybe some helpful statistics that mobility limitations are prevalent in our older adult population. And now mobility limitations can be defined in many different ways, and we sort of talked about that already. In the public census data, they define um, serious difficulty with walking or climbing stairs. So the information I'm providing you here is that there are 15% of Americans between 65 and 70 years, 74 years old, and 30% of Americans 75 and older who report this functional difficulty with their mobility in climbing or walking stairs. And given our aging population, the number of older adults in the United States who report this walking disability is only continuing to rise. Um, and it's exacerbating this problem that we're going to continue to see in healthcare, in physical therapy and outside more broadly. Um, so in the last seven years, we've seen a 25% increase in the older adults who have reported mobility impairments. And I think finally, the last point that I want to make with this slide is that it's important to note that mobility disability 
disability is not static. Individuals frequently transition from independence to disability due to illness, injury, or treatment. And for those reasons, regular and repeated assessment is going to be critically important to identify those when they are facing impairments and treat that specifically. Next slide. And beyond mobility limitations being very common in older adults, they're also very sensitive indicator to overall health and function. So they tell us quite a bit more about an older adult and their quality of life than just mobility alone. So here we've provided a summary of the literature that's been shown the strong association between mobility limitation with health, healthcare, independence, and even mortality. And I think um, Dr. Alexander's uh, figure there was really good tie in here with both mobility limitations being um, related to cognitive impairment and probably through cognitive impairment or uh, on its own is related to a higher risk of falls. And so that's really the important highlight for today's discussion, but wanting to give the lens um, that mobility can really inform us uh, broadly about older adults and their abilities, function, and health overall. So next slide. The good news in all of this though, is that we have effective treatments for mobility. And this is where I get to talk us up as a profession. So um, a very friendly audience for this portion, um, but the role that physical therapists can have in both identifying and treating those with impairments is really significant. Um, the literature is very strong that we have robust and valid tests to identify those with impairments. And when we identify them, we can treat their mobility impairments to improve both their mobility as well as the downstream health impacts that I showed on the last side. Um, so reducing you know, not only all of these other health outcomes, but specifically incidence of falls, which is our important highlight of today. So with this foundation and with this body of literature, our APTA Geriatrics Task Force um, focused on mobility in older adults was developed to tackle this issue of incorporating routine mobility assessment into our care as physical therapists for older adults. And so Sterling's going to take it from here on out to tell you a bit more about what we're working on. Good deal. So like Emma said, we, we as physical therapists in our profession, we have these amazing tests and measures that can help us identify when mobility is being limited or impaired and we can also treat when mobility is being limited and impaired. So we really need to make sure that we're taking the time to do those tests and measures on people and catch mobility impairment before they're coming to us as clinicians already with some kind of injury post a fall perhaps. And that's mainly the big vision of what the APTA mobility screening, uh, mobility screen task force was made under. We view this as an essential service to pre-screen and get ahead with prevention finding those mobility impairments prior to the, the impact of a fall or some other major health condition, uh, get, getting ahead and doing that prevention. And so our mission as a task force, and I really think our mission as a profession, is to establish like these goals of screening and efficiency in order to get ahead of impairments that are taking place in society and promote this type of tertiary wellness in our um, healthcare world to where third party payers recognize that it's better to prevent an illness rather than treat one. And I, so far we've made a lot of progress as a task force. We've done a ton of data review on different tests and measures to use, which we'll, we'll talk about later. And then, um, we're also in the process of writing a white paper and stay tuned for that to come out later. So next slide. This is our mobility screen data collection form. So these are the tests and measures that we've agreed upon after a thorough bit of research over the past year. And we've decided that this is really how we would like to see a mobility screen take place in the future. And we wanted to mention this in this call because even though we're the task force, this is something that all of us can be doing in the community and promoting within our communities. And it's a really simple thing. I think those of y'all looking on the slide can probably be really comfortable with all the tests and measures that are mentioned there. And through experience likely know that these are effective measures in detecting a mobility impairment and hopefully preventing fall risk in the future. And that's our big goal is getting ahead of these falls before they happen. And if y'all have any questions, we put uh, Mike Putoff's email right there. He's our fearless leader and y'all can reach out to him. And we'd love to see this uh, screen take place in the general public in the future. 
Thank y'all. Fantastic. Such great information tonight. Our fourth speaker for the evening is the chair for the newly formed APTA Geriatrics Skilled Nursing Facility, SIG, and will be spe speaking on multi-complexity. Richard White is the Corporate Rehabilitation Director of Education and Clinical Practice for Sigma Health Rehab. Additionally, he proudly chairs the APTA Geriatric Skilled Nursing Facility Special Interest Group. Based in Utica, New York, Richard guides and educates the Sigma Health Rehabilitation Team across New York State and New Jersey, focusing on best practices within skilled nursing facilities. Take it away, Richard. All right. Thank you again so much for having me. Um, I just, I, I got to say, just right off the bat, I feel like... Uh, almost like I'm back at, you know, CSM or another conference. My my mind's racing from everything everybody's kind of gone through. And it's, it's just really exciting. I'm taking down some notes and things that I want to follow up with some of you with uh, afterwards. So thank you all for, for being on this call and being a part of this. This is a, it's a great team. Um, so kind of like how, you know, uh, Sterling's kind of point of view about providing a definition. I got to be honest when I was assigned multi-complexity, I was already overwhelmed with the word itself. So I think unlike some of the other um, prior topics that were discussed with regard to falls, I kind of had to take a, a step back um, and, and really try to take advantage point of at like a 10,000 feet, because the more and more I dug into this, the more um, I would say overwhelmed uh, I became with with this uh, with this type of topic, but it's it's clearly a big one um, and and one we need to address and try to simplify as best we can. Um, so, what do we mean by multi complexity? We we're talking about the whole person living in living with multiple chronic conditions, advanced illness, and or with complicated biopsychosocial needs. Um, more than fifty percent of older adults have three or more chronic diseases. We know the interactions between treatments or interventions for two different conditions, as well as interactions between treatments and interventions for one condition and coexisting conditions may factor into decision making. So that's that's our role. Um, an example of this is taking you know, a statin medication, which may decrease cardiovascular risk, but may cause cognitive impairment or muscle weakness, leading to falls. Um, like uh, uh, Dr. Walters had brought up earlier on the call um, with regard to anti-dementia meds and things like that. So uh, a graphic on the side here to try to kind of give you a better picture of those interactions. So what are some considerations? So everyone's everyone's pictures are, and graphics are usually pretty pretty good. I uh, this is what I think of when I you know kind of ran into this topic was this overwhelming. Uh, you know, calculus and uh, organic chemistry and, you know, you, you just kind of like uh, get, you know, start to drown with these with these things that are flying into your head. But some of those considerations, you know, are biopsychosocial like we had in the definition. There's generational disparities to consider understanding, you know, of, of certain uh, residents or patients with and their comfort with healthcare providers in general differs. Um, communication skills differ uh, between residents and, and patients and caregivers. Um, education level has a has an impact on on things. Um, even the evidence and research that's out there currently, you know, we we like to lean on clinical practice guidelines as we should, um, but a lot of the times those those clinical practice guidelines are aimed at one particular uh, diagnosis and and trying to wrap. Uh, around those with interventions and um, and looking looking at that particular diagnosis, so we can be a little limited. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So the uh, American Geriatric Society expert panel um, on care for older adults with multimorbidity came out with. Uh, some guiding principles. So as overwhelmed as you may be, there there's some great stuff out there. And this is, you know, this is from 2012, but 
I, I think a lot of the research that's out there, and I, I know some of you would agree, but a lot of the research that's out there, just because it might be a little older, um, you know, it, is still valued and, and pertinent information that I think every now and then we need to kind of go back to when we get into topics like multi-complexity or multi-morbidity. Um, so these guiding principles were, were great to reference and and certainly great to kind of get you back on track with, with uh, the resident and their needs. So um, to elicit and incorporate patient preferences into medical decision-making for older adults with multimorbidity, we're gonna recognize the limitations of the evidence base, like we talked about sometimes with clinical practice guidelines, um, but to interpret and apply the medical literature specifically to older adults with multimorbidity. We wanna frame our clinical management decisions within the context of risks, burdens, benefits, and prognosis. Again, you know, we talked about that, or excuse me, um, Dr. Walters talked about that with regard to uh, you know, um, pharmacology. Um, we talked about that with, with the other pieces that were discussed earlier on this call as well. Consider treatment complexity and feasibility when making clinical management decisions for older adults with multimorbidity. I think this is a big piece where, you know, I don't, I don't know the, uh, you know, all the people that are on this call, but I'd venture to guess that there aren't many students. And I think this is one of those, those topics where, you know, as a student, when you're first out there in this world, this, this can be on, whether it's your first clinical or your first job, um, you know, it's time to get real about about what's feasible um, when making these clinical uh, decisions with our with our residents. Um, use strategies for choosing therapies that optimize benefit, minimize harm, and enhance quality of life for older adults with multimorbidity. So again, kind of bringing it back to um, these guiding principles is a great way to own things and and bring them together when you're feeling overwhelmed and like you're on an island in a different universe. Um, so, and you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So again, we go, we go back and forth, right? Like this is overwhelming. This is complicated, multi-complexity. We go back to, you know, these guiding principles um, and, and how else can we simplify this? And I think, you know, the guide to PT practice has always been something that's referenced and something that we need to you know, have in our back pocket um, to look back on. And because the truth is, the plan is what it's always been, right? Um, we, we evaluate our residents. We consider that care plans should be designed and implemented according to their individual needs, right? These, these aren't new um, thoughts and ideas uh, that, have, that have come up, but, but falling back to them is always critical to our, our decision-making. Ongoing assessment and adjustment of the plan of care to obtain the best outcomes for our residents' needs. And one, one common theme that I heard throughout here is, is communication um, and education, not just with the residents themselves, but with our whole, you know, I, again, I'm biased because I'm you know, referencing the skilled nursing side of things, but in general, the interdisciplinary team. And, you know, if that's with older adults in the community, you still have social work involvement. You still have, um, you know, your, your medical doctors, your PAs, your NPs, um, you know, nurses, caregivers, family, friends that are, that are going in with these residents, or excuse me, with these patients, uh, that we want everyone to have the same understanding of an involvement uh, in their plan of care. So everybody's on the same page speaking the same language uh, and, and prioritizing the care for that resident uh, that they need. Um, and that includes too, excuse me, all, you know, all disciplines um, when we're working all together. So again, the, the graphic here on the side is just that depiction of, you know, we're going through our evaluation, we're, we're, we're administering an intervention, we're, we're tracking the outcome, but we're constantly reassessing and, and fixing our plan of care to, to cater to that particular resident. Wonderful, thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, our final speaker is a member of the APTA Geriatrics National Council, 
for Older Adults Task Force, and we'll be speaking on our fifth and final topic, What Matters Most? Elizabeth Reagan is a clinical assistant professor and researcher at the University of South Carolina Physical Therapy Program and a member of the APTA Geriatrics National Council on Aging Task Force. Elizabeth's research agenda focuses on community physical activity programs to improve health for older adults and people with permanent mobility impairments and the role of the PT in those programs. Elizabeth also teaches wellness and health promotion to Doctor of Physical Therapy students. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm happy to be rounding out uh, these five M's with the one that I think that matters most, which is what matters most. And the definition that um, Dr. Uh, Molnar uses in his um, five M's is each individual's own meaningful health outcomes goals and care preferences. So what I'm gonna talk about here is what does that mean in the context of fall prevention, both in rehabilitation and in community settings? So you can move to the next one. And I think this comes down to two different things. And that is the relative importance that our patients and clients place on something, in this case, fall prevention, and whether or not that they feel that they can control that. So the idea of salience and self-efficacy is key and absolutely and foremost, very individual for each older adult. You can go to the next. Right, and I know this slide is a little bit busy, but I wanna explain this uh, graphic here, which I think is a really nice way to um, frame some of the things that we think about from an individual perspective that we need to explore when we're talking about what matters most to older adults in relationship to fall prevention. So there's two things on this slide that um, um, Kiyoshi Tio looked at in her qualitative study um, that explored patient preferences around and um, beliefs around fall prevention strategies. So on the left, you have these three themes, which I'll go through individually. And on the right, you have what they culminate in and how they respond to um, fall prevention activities. So there's a continuum here and that starts with they respond with fully accepting and engaging in those um, fall prevention. So they're accepting that they have fall risk and they're engaging in the recommendations to reduce that fall risk. In the middle, you have people who are more ambivalent um, because of one of these themes or a combination of these themes and they may um, not fully buy into their fall risk um, or they may only selectively engage in fall prevention strategies. And finally, on the opposite end of that spectrum is the area of denial, um, which I think is an interesting term here that to me, it's either that they um, are not interested in fall prevention, and that is often because they don't think that they can um, have any control over those risk factors, or they've tried and they're giving up. So these three themes on the left that are very individualized in how people think about fall risk and fall prevention, the first is their uh, perception about the risk and whether or not it is temporary or permanent. And often that is framed around, um, they call it here their health condition, but it could be what I would frame it here for, um, for us as um, rehabilitation specialists is their uh, impairments. So do they feel that they're temporary and um, that they will go away eventually um, and um, or do they feel like they're more permanent and um, they don't feel like that they have any influence on them. So an example of a temporary one would be something like someone who had an acute illness who is dealing with lines, leads, and tubes and they know that they may, because that's complex, they may need help getting to the bathroom and they're willing to ask for help. On the opposite end is maybe someone who has 
more permanent mobility impairments, either related to what they feel is the natural part of aging or some other health condition that influenced that. And um, they feel that they don't necessarily have control, that, it, that as they get older, it's only going to get worse, and they're less likely to engage in fall prevention. Um, on the bottom is how they feel about the strategies themselves. So are they pretty easy to do and subtle, meaning something that they could engage independently, like um, um, clearing their home of clutter or keeping things nearby um, or, um, or using their glasses? Or are they more major and require something more visual, like a mobility aid, like a walker, or engaging um, with a ramp at their home, or even engaging in community fall prevention programs? And they're, they may be less likely if they feel that these are major and really visual. And those two come together in this idea of self-identity, which I think if you work with older adults, you're familiar with this piece of, um, of the aging process and how um, losing some uh, strength and vigor or um, view of themselves, and um, it could be uh, one of the study participants here said he didn't want to use a cane because he felt very vain and that only old people use canes and he fell and then knew that that was the reason. Um, another example here would be something that's a threat to self-identity around fall prevention is that they have become weaker when maybe they spent their whole working lives um, as a very athletic or active person in some kind of very active job. So I think if we are able to consider these three things and when we start engaging with our patients and clients, it will make a difference. All right, you can go to the next slide. Um, and the way that we do that is through patient-centered care, right, which just means open communication and partnering with our patients. You can go to the next slide. And I think that the way we do that is these four things, and I'm going to talk about each of them briefly, but we need to evaluate their fall risk and figure out what kinds of behaviors are most helpful, understand whether they're ready and able to engage in those changes. Um, and the way that we do that is by partnering with our individual patients to figure out what matters to them, what motivates them, what they desire and what they enjoy, and then connecting them to those clinical and community resources that are important. I can go to the next slide. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, STEADY, which is CDC has a um, full, um, it's, it's a lot of resources, and it also includes an algorithm for reducing fall risk for older adults. And the al algorithm is a very simple way for clinicians to engage in um, screening, assessment, and intervention for fall risk, and to just determine those needs and what they are for further desired behaviors. And we've talked about a lot of those desired behaviors already. All right, you can go to the next one. Um, and I think though, it's really important to know, right, from what we talked about, if, if they're really ready for making these changes and if they believe that they can. So they may recognize their risk, but not feel they can make a change, or they may not recognize their risk at all, depending on what else they have going on. So, and do they feel like that, that the cost benefit of, you know, maybe it has a threat to their self-identity, but it's important uh, for them to be able to engage in the things that are important to them out in the community, like being independent and grocery shopping or going and seeing their um, grandchild's play or going to church and all of those types of things. And if you're able to connect those, it will make a difference. All right, you can go to the next one. Um, and one of the ways that we can do this is motivational interviewing. Uh, the resources on here are really nice if you haven't seen them. There are motivational interviewing articles specifically about fall prevention or just how to engage in your clinical practice. But I think the biggest thing here is, is again, partnering with your patients in open communication without judgment and without um, directives so that they can come to the conclusion that it is that you're guiding them in figuring out what is important and how engaging in these fall behaviors will make a difference in their quality of life. All right, you can go to the next slide. 
And then finally, once they believe they can do it, connecting them though to those resources so they can carry it out. The National Council on Aging has a lot of resources in um, community evidence-based fall prevention programs, both from an education focus perspective and an exercise perspective. And uh, we talked about them a little bit, some of them already, but these links will get you to um, what where these programs are. They're across the country and, um, and give you information on each of those that you can engage with your patients so that they can figure out what makes the most sense for them and what they might enjoy. Right, that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to close this out, although I don't really feel like there's anything I could say that would be more fabulous than what our speakers have had to say this evening. Um, I do just have some next steps as far as resources and some exciting information. So uh, if you guys can hang out for a few more minutes, that'd be great. If you have to get off the call, that's fine. This is being recorded and we will put the recording as well as the handout um, on the Balance and Fall SIG website and on the discussion portal, portal online if you're a BF SIG member and have access to that. Um, before I do, I just want to give another hearty thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, this was a labor of love to put together and our speakers have done a fabulous job at collaborating, hitting their deadlines, having amazing quality information, um, and also going through other people's slides <laughs> to really provide an amazingly cohesive presentation. So thank you so much to all of you. Um, I also want to give a big thanks to Beth Quinn as well. Um, she actually stepped in an hour before the call to narrate the call. So our student liaison, Daniel, could not be with us here tonight. He is on his first clinical in Houston, Texas, and does not still have power in his apartment complex. Um, so Daniel is here with us in spirit tonight, but he was able to get a hold of us to let us know that um, he was not able to make it. So uh, next year he will be the MC um, and we will make sure that he doesn't summon any hurricanes to get out of it next year. <laughs> so just as far as some next steps, um, the Balance and Fall Sick does have some existing as well as some up and coming resources to help you plan for your National Falls Prevention Awareness Week. We have um, the National Falls Prevention Awareness Week event how-to. So this is everything from soup to nuts on how to contact clinicians, associate with business and get sponsoring to provide a, as big or as small of an event as you'd like. We also have our outcome measures toolkit. Um, and then we have three toolkits and, and activities in the works. So we have a multi-specialty efforts uh, toolkit, which is trying to encourage individuals who don't see themselves as geriatric physical therapists to participate in fall screening and providing some tools for those folks. Um, we're also currently ha are having our neurologic conditions in falls and older adult toolkit um, being reviewed by the executive board as well. So this is looking specifically at stroke, brain injury, including concussion, because that's a mild brain injury, um, and Parkinson's disease and looking specifically at the information there. And then we have a community education campaign as well. Um, we're in the process of creating PowerPoints that our members can present to uh, different audiences. So students presenting to students, um, students and PTs presenting to students and other PTs, presenting to our allied healthcare professionals and also presenting to the non-healthcare community. Um, so those will be up and coming. The reason why we are working on those is, and I don't have a slide on, I feel like I should have had fireworks or something. Uh, PT month, which happens every year in October, always has a theme and this year's theme will be fall prevention. So we are fast at work behind the scenes to get you as much information um, as possible. So if you don't get a chance to celebrate Falls Prevention Awareness Week in September, we will have a whole Falls Prevention Awareness Month in October. So you've got plenty of time to plan your events. I also want to give a big shout out to the APTA Geriatric Special Interest Group, both those who were here and who were not here. Um, so we have obviously the Balance and Fall SIG, and there are some SIGs that were not represented tonight, and it was not because they were not qualified or anything. That's just kind of how the topics fell for us. So they were not snubbed for any reason, I promise. Um, but there we have bone health, cognitive and mental health, global health, health promotion and wellness, residency and fellowship, and our skilled nursing facility SIG, which is brand new. So if you have not joined the SNF SIG, please, please, please do so. I beg of you. Um, Rich is on the call. He's amazing, obviously. So um, go hang out with them. Just some important resources from the Balance and Fall SIG outside of the toolkits that we have. Um, we do still have our monthly challenge. Also, if you have a question about clinical practice and you are having a hard time finding the answer or need help, our research liaison can help you with that. We do have a pretty consistent Jerry Notes presence as well. Um, we continue to submit programming for CSM every year. Uh, we'll put up to, we, updates on the uh, website as well as on the discussion portal. Um, we're continuing our work with the neuro and oncology balance and 
SIG balance and falls SIG groups as well. Um, they've recently had switch over in leadership. So we're currently kind of getting our, our new plan together for the new group. Um, we always have volunteer opportunities. So if you're interested in volunteer opportunities, we've always got work to do around here. Um, and we would love to have more, more energy. Some of the people who you've heard tonight are new members to our SIG. And obviously people bring a great energy. Um, and then we'll also be hosting the Journal Club in September as well. All right. Thank you all so much for attending tonight. I am so incredibly energized by hearing all these speakers. I've been looking at these slides for a month and I knew it was coming, but the delivery was amazing. So I hope you guys are all as energized as I am. Feel free to email us with any questions that you have um, in the recording, as well as the handout for the PowerPoint will also be online. Thank you guys so much and happy National Falls Prevention Awareness Week and PT Month coming up.